Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. Let's talk gardening. Isn't that one of your favorite things to do? And I love doing it at every opportunity. So great to see you all here. Let's give a shout out to Shandy's Garden. Happy birthday. And I hope you have great success with your chickens as you have them laying. My son has chickens and just this last week they started laying for the first time. So that's always exciting when you get your chickens laying. Hello to In the Garden with Eli and Kate and welcome back Prepper Chris who's been gone for a while. So glad that you are fitting us into your vacation schedule, Chris. We've missed you. And of course, Jay and Heidi are with us today. Fantastic moderators as we move forward with just a wonderful discussion like we do every Monday about gardening. Hello, love and peace. Thank you so much to start the day with that contribution. Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful topic as I need this advice. We had to pull our squash plants yesterday because they stopped producing. Yes, and that's one reason why I wanted to bring this up because for many of us, we are right in the middle of our growing season and things are grow going great and growing great and it's hard after spending all the effort with our seeds and seedlings and transplants and soil and crazy weather that too many of us are having and we finally get to that point where the plants are growing but not all plants really should be growing in our garden. At some point, it's a difficult, extremely difficult decision. But at some point, it's the best decision to pull the plants, to kill them, to open up that space so that other plants can live. So you've been pulling squash plants because they stopped producing. That is a great reason to kill your plants and it's it's typically cucumbers or and squash plants as well they'll start producing they can produce pretty well and at some point they'll stop producing or the production just drops to a level that it really isn't worth the effort anymore so that's in my opinion a relatively easy decision when the plant is clearly not performing then go ahead and pull that plant you open up the space and especially for most of us the beginning of october or beginning of august beginning of uh, the the fall garden period where we're putting plants in the ground with that anticipation that they're going to be growing into october you need the space in your garden so take out the plants that aren't performing another easy decision is disease. If you've got a plant with disease, pull it. Yes, many of the diseases in our garden we can fight. We can make that effort to try to keep the plant growing. But even if a diseased plant recovers, it seldom performs as well as a healthy plant with, without the disease in the first place. So it's it's hard we baby our gardens we try to take care of our plants if they're sick we want to make them healthy but if you have limited time to garden and if you have limited space in your garden go ahead and free up that space go ahead and kill those plants it's hard but it often is necessary and just this week I'm, I'm facing that dilemma with one of my tomato plants. I haven't identified exactly what's wrong with it, but all the other plants are doing so well, and this one plant is struggling. And I'm suspecting that it might have a disease, and I don't want that to spread to the other plants. And so it's probably going to be a goner this week because it's better to free up that space because it takes time to identify some of the diseases. The, the initial stages when things start going wrong with our plants is that the leaves will turn yellow and they begin to drop off from the base. 
Well, that could be a sign of overwatering. It could be a sign of underwatering. It could be an issue with the weather that has affected that particular plant. It could be a pest problem. It could be a disease problem. And so as you're trying to figure out exactly what the problem is, the problem often is getting worse. And if you wait too long to figure it all out, that problem may begin spreading to other plants. So it's hard, especially if you only have a few plants in the first place. Now, I have so many tomato plants growing that for me to take one out really isn't that big a deal. And that it's easier for me to take out a plant that is not performing or underperforming than it is to spend the time to try to get it to recover and get back to the point that where the others were. And I did that last year. It is, it's common practice. It's not a bad thing. And I had one tomato plant last year in the same spot. So I'm beginning to think it might be something in the soil. And I struggled with it and I tried to pruning and I tried <laughs> giving it all that extra loving care and it just didn't work. So the idea of you cut bait and continue fishing, well, sometimes you gotta cut down the plant and continue gardening. So there's Prepper Chris. I have Asian beetles. Should I remove chewed leaves? And so this, this is a little bit different. And thank you for that contribution, Chris. And it really is good to have you back. So chewed leaves are not necessarily a bad thing. They might not look good. And I recently made a batch of sauerkraut with my Napa cabbage. And some of those leaves were chewed. I just washed them off and cut them up and made them into sauerkraut. If I was trying to make a nice decorative salad and serving it to guests, I might not serve the chewed leaves, but most of the time there's nothing wrong with leaves that have been chewed. And by cutting them off, you're depriving the plant of the, the energy that the rest of the leaf can provide. Now, if the the damage is severe and you've, your plant has been attacked by a number of insect pests and eating a lot of leaves, look closely because in that case, it's not necessarily the chewed leaves, though often it is, but there might be other leaves that have the eggs on them and you either cut off the leaf with the eggs and toss it or destroy the eggs while they're still on the leaf but it also could be a way for a disease to enter the plant. So if you ha have an area that is susceptible to a particular plant disease, then, and usually it's like a bacterial disease that tends to spread or possibly a viral disease with the spores blowing onto those damaged leaves, that could possibly be a problem. And in that case, yeah, cut off the damaged leaves so that they don't cause the, the disease to enter into it. But for the most part, if, if I recognize what is chewing my leaves, like the only pest I really have in my garden right now is grasshoppers. And so I recognize the leaves that the grasshoppers are chewing on. It's not a big deal. And I'm not going to take extra effort to remove those leaves just because the grasshoppers have chewed on them. And the, the, I haven't seen any indication of them this year, but most years I have leaf cutter bees in the area. And the way they chew into the leaves is very distinctive. And I leave those leaves on the plant as well because it, it's not really posing a problem. The leaf cutter bee comes in, chews out their little circle of leaf to take it back to the nest and the rest of the leaf stays on the plant. So it, it is a bit selective and you have to decide which one or which approach is the best. But for the most part, I, I'll remove leaves that clearly have disease. I'll remove the leaves that are yellowed and no longer producing any energy for the plant, uh, but I won't remove the, the leaves that have been chewed on. So Gilles Leger, when I hung my garlic to dry, I hung it with the leaves up. Now I found out it should be the opposite. Will this make a difference? No, not really. The, 
the whole idea of hanging the garlic is just to give that garlic a chance to cure so that that paper that surrounds the, the garlic has a chance to dry out and it protects the garlic bulb so that you can store it. Hanging it in the way that most of us hang it is just an easy way to do it. But uh, you can look at actually uh, Eli and Kate have some videos that show how they hang their onions and it's the same idea as with hanging garlic. And there really isn't an upside or a downside. It's just how you choose to, to secure the garlic while it's drying. And so for some of us, you might see that the, the, the leaves are up and that's typically the way I do it is I'll wrap my leaves and, and then hang them in a small bundle so that the bulb is down. And then you have others like Eli and Kate that will actually run a line and they thread in their onion and their garlic so that the leaves are down. And that's just because the, the line supports the, the bulb as those leaves are, are hanging through it. So uh, don't worry about it. it. It really doesn't make a big difference. As long as you've got the air circulation around that bulb so that it can dry and that it can cure, that's really all you're doing. And you don't even need to hang it. Most years I harvest my garlic right when the monsoon monsoon season is is kicking up and so I can't put them outside to, to dry in the sun which would be nice and I really don't have a good spot to hang them effectively and efficiently and so I, I've shown this in some of my older videos with the garlic I just lay them out on newspaper so they're not even hanging at all so it, it, it isn't that big a deal to really think about it to any extreme that you're doing it wrong Shandy's Garden, hello. How can I tell 100% that I have an all-female flowering loofa gourd vine? I think I do because each blossom has a baby that turns brown. First time growing, hate to pull. And so the, the gourds are very similar to, to squashes. And, and I have a video on the, the hand pollinating of the squashes. And I, I show some close-ups of the flowers and how you can tell the difference between the male and the female flower. And it, it's very similar to gourds. You, you look at the flower and you look at the base of the flower and you, you can learn over time. And especially if you have a comparison, hopefully you do have some male flowers. You can tell that the male flower stock is, is much more narrow. It tends to be the same size from top to bottom. And with a female flower, it tends to be a little more bulbous it it doesn't have that same symmetry of that cylindrical tube and it that it's that little bulb closer to the the flower that turns into the gourd and if you look closely you'll be able to figure it out that oh yeah that that looks like that's where the ovaries would be and that's how the fruit is going to develop it's unusual to have all female and so uh, keep looking because you should have some male flowers pop up. But it, it is possible. There, there are those times when it seems like it's nothing but the female flowers growing. And if they're not pollinated, they're going to turn brown and fall off. So uh, you're, you're probably right in, in this analysis that it's all female at this point and that it can if you're looking close, you can see that it looks like it's a female stem on that flower, and then it falls off after turning brown. It's not being pollinated. So I hope you get some male flowers showing up soon. This is one of those things that I'll be discussing in a, in a future video. I think it's a, always a good idea to grow at least two of the plants that require pollination from a different type of flower. It, it's all about the gynecious and dioecious and all those different types of plants, some that have male and female flowers, some that have just the male flowers, some that have just the female flowers. But when you've got the plants that have both male and female flowers, grow two plants. That way, if one plant has too many male 
or, or too many female, it actually can benefit the other plant. And so if you have a second gourd plant, loofah gourd plant, and it has some male flowers, then that will help pollinate the loofah gourd plant that you have that is mostly female flowers. So I'm always growing it at least two. I've got two zucchini plants that are growing in my garden right now. And I actually have um, three of the delicata squash plants for the same reason, so that they can cross pollinate each other and I can be sure that I get the, the fruit on those plants. So that's really the, the biggest thing to, to be concerned about. Grandpa Gordy says, I killed the biggest tomato plant yesterday. It was the only producing blossoms with one snip and suddenly the plants underneath are in heaven. So that's that's another really good reason. And that's, and that's one of those things when I say to open up the space in your garden. Sometimes killing one plant, removing one plant that is actually causing multiple plants around it to suffer is the best thing for your garden. <coughs> it, it's If you have one big tomato plant and it's just not producing as well as you would like it to, or you notice that a whole bunch of plants underneath it aren't producing, yeah, taking out that one big one that was shading all the others, I was taking all the nutrients from all the others, that could be a reason to free up the space and give those other plants the opportunity to produce, which is really what it's all about. And again, that is so hard when, when you have a successful plant, you know, it, it's easy when you're doing the, the diseased plants and when you're doing the ones that are struggling, but, but it may be the right decision to take out the plant that's doing the best so that it can benefit multiple plants that might be underneath. So <coughs> it's, 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 it's what kind of gardener do you want to be? Do you want to be that gardener that lets everything live? There's nothing wrong with that. And everything is okay. Or do you want to be the gardener that really focuses on getting the best? And sometimes that focus really means looking at each and every plant and deciding whether it belongs and whether it deserves to stay. And I'm so guilty of that myself, where I, I like to let plants live. If a plant <laughs> survives in my garden with my harsh environment, I'm ready to give it the benefit of the doubt. But that's not always the case. And so another time that I'm also confronting right now in, in an area that my granddaughters put some beet seeds in, is thinning. Now we don't really think of thinning plants or pricking out plants as a way that is, is detrimental. It's just a normal activity, but we're killing those plants. We have to pull out some of those plants intentionally to let those others survive. And beets are a great example of this. If, if you put a beet seed in the ground, it's really not a seed, it's actually a small fruit that is made up of multiple seeds. And so a single beet seed might actually give you three or four or five beet plants. And if you let all of those grow, you're gonna get three or four or five beet roots, assuming that's why you're growing the plants. And they're gonna be small because they're all competing with each other. Early in their lives, if you snip them out to just leave one plant, you're gonna get a big beetroot. And that's really the best way to do it. So to get that one big beetroot, you've gotta kill all of its brothers and sisters that are growing right next to it. That's a necessary part of gardening. And so it becomes easier when we think about plants like that. Carrots are another great example, those small seeds are so difficult to get perfect spacing that we just sprinkle the carrot seeds and then they start growing and then we take out the carrots that are interfering with the others while they're still small. Well, if you can do that with the, the small plants like a, a, a beet or a carrot, 
then why can't you do it with the bigger plants like a pepper or a tomato or a squash or a gourd? It's the same basic concept. It's the same principle. It's the same activity. It's just harder to do when the plants are actively growing. Jay saying, I recently got a drying rack that is a grid top and looks like a TV table. My garlic dried upside down with a bulb top and greens hanging. That, that's a great, great idea. And I, I saw a video recently, same kind of thing, taking the, the like wire fencing that is designed in a grid like that and turning it into a hanging rack. So um, good for you. That's a, that's a great suggestion. It can make it really easy to, to dry your onions and your garlic if you just feed them through that opening and it makes it the the drying ideal space for those kind of plants gardening with caitlin is wondering the cucumber beetles are doing my pruning job for me lol some leaves die from life being sucked out of them while new leaves form kind of working out i i, I like that that idea and that's kind of the basic philosophy uh, that i have as well is i let nature take the first stab at it because often nature and I mentioned the yellowing of the leaves which is often a normal process and a normal part of the plants growing as they get taller the roots can only support so much of the plants growth so it sacrifices the lower leaves so that the upper leaves can can grow and give you a bigger taller more robust plant so with the leaves in that case, yeah, I, I just let them yellow and most of the time just let them fall off. And insects are often attacking the weakest leaves. And same thing, I'll just let the pests eat away and those leaves will end up falling off and it really isn't much work. So if you've got an infestation and it's a disastrous amount of pests, insects, then maybe a little more effort needs to be done. But for the most part, like you, I just let it all work out and it really does seem to work out with, without too much difficulty and without any big problems. And so it's, it, it's how much effort you want to put into gardening. As big as my garden is and as many plants as I grow, I'm basically a lazy gardener. I like to, have somebody else take care of my plants and nature is really my best buddy when it comes to taking care of my plants good and bad with the pests without the pests the weather all of that plays into it but it usually works out pretty well if you just have some patience and sit back and wait to see what happens and often exactly that it works out Big Wheel Dog 82. I planted two sugar baby watermelon plants and only got three mature melons, and the new ones are dying off. Suggestions. And so uh, it, I, I've grown sugar baby uh, last year and the year before. I did not grow it this year. And that seems to be a, a trend with the sugar babies. Mine were exactly the same way. There are some concerns and issues that play in when you're when you're growing melons first off a plant like a sugar baby those are small melons and it's not going to, to produce a lot of melons it's going to stay relatively compact and actually getting two or three mature melons is pretty good and i think i think three melons per plant was about the most i ever got when we are looking at the time of year that these plants are growing and why the flowers are falling off, look to your weather. That's often the, the main reason for it. When the flowers get above about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 32 degrees Celsius, it affects the pollination. And if the, the flower isn't pollinated properly, it's going to fall off. So if you've been encountering some high temperatures, or very dry, windy conditions. That's the most common reason for the flowers to, to fall off. And so at the height of summer, many of us are exposed to those conditions. And it's the flowers that formed earlier before those high temperatures and dry winds came 
that were pollinated and the fruit formed. And you look at your plant and you think, wow, the plant's doing great. I've got fruit. And then new flowers appear and those flowers die off. It's most often the weather in that second phase of flowering that causes that problem. So, so look to those kind of conditions. If it's not the, the, the weather related, then start looking at pests to see if maybe the pests are, are eating the flowers. You know, the grasshoppers might be coming in and causing potential or caterpillars. It could be a lot of those kind of, of issues, but I'd, I'd put my money probably on the weather when it's an issue that happens at, at this time of year. And I, I see that or have seen that in my uh, greenhouse tomatoes. I had a brief period when the temperatures got extremely high in my greenhouse. And my first thought was that I've got an insect in here that's chewing off all of these new flowers. And then I stopped and thought about it. And it's like, no, nope, it's just been too hot. And all those other flowers that are doing great were shaded by the plant and they fertilized and were pollinated and grew into wonderful tomatoes. But primarily the ones around the edges that were exposed to the direct sun, those were the ones that were falling off and figured it out. I'm not too worried about it. Now that the conditions are actually starting to cool, today's a downright cool day in my garden. Everything is actually working out pretty well. So. It's putting all those pieces together, together, doing that detective work that really helps figure out where the, the problem comes into play. So Dusty Flat says, I have freezer panels used for building and want to make a root cellar with them. Just can't figure out where to put it. And then the digging. So I, I love projects like that. I'd said before, that's one of the things I like about the, the whole gardening journey is building the aspects of gardening, putting all the pieces together. I spend a lot of time figuring out the where. And so I hope you're not in a rush because I often will just stand in the garden and just do a 360 over and over again as I'm looking at where things are and where things will be. And my garden plan that I drew out four years ago where it's at right now is close to what I had originally planned. But when it actually came time to put some of those things in place, after standing, after looking, after thinking, after having that patience, some major aspects of my garden actually ended up being in a different place because of the, the, the weather and the animals and everything else that that plays into those kind of decisions. So uh, you might want to just take some time. If, unless you're in a rush, a rush, go ahead and figure out where you're going to do it. And I've got one area that I was going to put in some fence posts to, to help, the, help create a shade garden area behind the fence. And I started digging and my soil was just too hard and rocky in that area. So I'm now figuring out where I'm going to put that project because it's not going in that first spot I wanted to do it in because it was just too hard to dig. So anything that you're going to dig, I encourage you to choose a location where the digging is easier because I, I don't enjoy spending a lot of time digging holes when I don't have to. So. Thank you for that super sticker, Chris. I do appreciate it. It really is good to, to have you here. It, you know, so many of you have been here for years. And, and I know those of you who aren't here will watch on replay and you've been doing that for years. But there are so many of you that have been here on a regular basis and then you aren't here and, and we miss you. So it's, it's nice that, that you're able to, to come back. So um, gardening with Caitlin says, what does this button do? So I'm not exactly sure which button you pushed, but uh, it's, it's showing that you've been a member. Maybe it's the member identification button. I don't even know what that one might be. But uh, if, if someone knows what that button is, 
and yeah, there you go. I see. So that's good. So always nice to be learning new things on YouTube as you're joining in on a Monday. So that's funny. Uh, okay, let's see. Valerie is asking Brian what the what are the memberships for. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about the the membership. So depending on how you're watching this, you might see a blue and white button beneath the video that says join. You'll also see a link in the description. And the idea is that you can join the Gardner Scott community. We have three different levels of membership. All of the levels give you access to our private Facebook group. And in that group on Facebook, we share videos, we share photos. It's a very active group of gardeners helping each other out. Now I'm there and I now I'll, I'll often chime in and I'll often help out, but most of the time I'm just reading along and learning and watching and seeing what everybody else is doing because there's some really good information being passed back and forth. It, it's, it really is a, a productive group of, of gardeners helping each other out. It, it, it really isn't just a, a Facebook group where you pop in. I mean, it really is a space to go and learn more about gardening. So all the members receive that. And then at the, the training and the collaborative level, I do members only live streams. So at least once a month, we get together with a, a live stream for just the members who have signed up for the channel membership. And it's a small group discussion. Often it's just 12 or 14 of us and we're chatting back and forth. I'm answering all of the questions on this live stream. I don't get to all the questions that are being asked, but in those members only live stream, I get to all the questions. And then there's other perks for the, the like at the collaboration level there's usually each month I'll offer a code so like if you want to get some of them the Gardner Scott merch like a t-shirt or something there's a code for a discount on some of that merch so those are the, the most commonly used perks that come with the membership there are a few others that are thrown in from time to time but uh, that's what the membership is for it's just an opportunity and it it doesn't take away from the the videos and the live streams. I still do that. Those are all free, of course. But it, it's a it's a way to support the channel, so that I could keep doing what I'm doing, and also to give you access to other gardeners. So if it's something that might interest you, then become a member. And it I, it is a fabulous group of of people. Uh, colorblind gardener says power planters make digging post holes much easier i actually have a gas powered auger that i got and that's what i used primarily to make my my uh enclosed garden because there was a lot of post hole digging for that but i made the mistake of not emptying the gas out of it over the winter and it didn't start up this spring so that's why i was trying to dig by hand so first i need to either get that one fixed but i also got an electric powered auger that i've used briefly and that makes all the difference so yes powered tools definitely make a difference in doing the post holes i have the old classic manual post hole digger and my soil it just takes forever I, when i dig with that it'll take 45 minutes to an hour to dig a hole two feet deep. I mean, that's how bad my soil is. So that's why I got the power tools because it, it definitely makes a difference. Uh, Jeremy Ransom says, I have a rabbit that's mocking me. It stole a softball sized cantaloupe, ate half of it and left it right at the gate from the backyard to the side yard garden. I I feel your pain. I, I, I love Mala because she's doing a great job keeping the rabbits at bay. When she's not out, occasionally I'll look out the window and see them, but it's it's nice to have a, a garden buddy like Mala who helps keep the, the rabbits at bay. So get yourself a dog. If, you, if you're a dog person, that definitely helps. But I, I, I felt that way too, that the rabbits are mocking me in the past. The gophers as well. And I saw, 
I got my, my phone out to, to start filming it, and I, I missed it by just a little bit. But Mala does a great job of, of dealing with the gophers as well. She's actually taken out two gophers in, in the recent couple weeks. And I saw her in, in frozen mode as she was, was looking at the ground, and I could actually see the plant shaking as the gopher was eating it. Now, it's on the periphery of my garden. It was just a weed. I wasn't that concerned about it, but it was so fascinating not only to see a, an animal like a gopher actually in the act of eating a plant, but Mala was right there, and she pounced, and she started digging, and she didn't get that gopher, but she definitely put some serious fear into that gopher's heart. I have no doubt of that, and it's, it's the animals that we have around us, I think, that can make a big difference in dealing with some, with some of those pests. Gilles wondering, why do we have to leave the stalks attached to garlic as it dries? Can we just snip them off then dry, which I have not done. So the, the bulb needs to like dry as a whole and each of those leaves is attached to a paper shell. And so the number of leaves you have actually can correlate directly to the protection around the, the 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 garlic bulb itself and so first it's easy to leave them on but they're if you cut too close to the bulb before it's cured it it can affect how long that bulb can be stored and so it's usually best to just let it dry so that you know the entire bulb has basically enclosed itself in that protective layer. Now, you don't need to leave the leaves whole. You can cut them in half. Just don't cut them very close to the, the bulb so that you ensure that that bulb gets the full protection of, of each of those dry layers. So uh, snip them so that they're manageable if, depending on where it is that you're allowing those bulbs to cure just try to avoid cutting them right at the base of the of, of the leaf right there where the bulb develops until it's dried and until it's cured that'll help ensure that you have the the, the best storage if you're planning on using the garlic right away then yeah you can cut the leaves off completely because it's not going to be that big an issue it's really done more for the storage component and so that the the cloves can or the bulbs can be left alone for months before you use them. So Willie Zollicoffer is a new member. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for joining. There's when you look at the, the information as part of the, the where you click to become a member, <coughs> it tells you all about and there's a link there as well to to join in the Facebook group. So hope to see you there. And thanks for joining. That's fantastic. Okay, it's uh, I want to get back to the idea of, of killing plants. The, the idea of the big plants, it's easy when we talk squash and we talk tomatoes, relatively easy. When it, when it comes time to get rid of a plant and it's just a little green plant that's struggling, okay, piece of cake, yeah, just pull it. But what if it's a tree? What if it's something that you've been growing for a long time? Or what I see most often <coughs> is you move into a new house and there are trees there and especially a producing fruit tree. What do you do when it's not right? It's not in the best location, especially if you're continually <laughs> padding, battling the, the pests and the disease take out the tree. I've done it. It's painful, but sometimes it's the best thing to do, especially if you've got a tree that's being ravaged by Japanese beetles or a blight that you just can't cure. Take it out. Start over again. <clears throat> the, most, the most recent issue I had was with deer. And, and I have one video where I mentioned that briefly, where the deer 
before I had put all of the, the protection around my plants had come in and ate the plants pretty severely. My tendency, like most gardeners, is to then protect that plant and let it grow. And that was my initial inclination. But I, I stopped and, and said, okay, these young fruit trees that I'm putting into my mini orchard are going to take three to five years to produce fruit. A new tree that I'm putting in, maybe a two-year-old tree that, that will then take three years to produce fruit, has been the approach I do. I'm putting in bare root trees. So if that two-year-old tree, and some of them were actually the next year, was eaten down to just nubs and just buds, and then I let it grow again, I have a whole nother three to five year cycle that needs to start. And the tree has been stressed dramatically. And there's just a few buds to produce those new branches. So it's probably going to take even longer than that for that, true, that tree to produce fruit. It makes more sense to just take that tree out and put a brand new one in its place and start the clock with a healthy tree that isn't struggling. Now, as an experiment, I went ahead and did that. I dug up two trees in particular that had been eaten down to next to nothing and Mala didn't help because she likes to to chew on some of those trees that aren't protected and put in new trees. But the old ones I actually moved to another section of my yard and planted them there to see how long it takes for a tree that's been so damaged that it looks like it's dead, how long it takes for a tree like that to recover. And it really surprised me. The, the one tree in particular that was devastated actually recovered pretty well this year. And it, it's in a happy spot and I'm caring for it. And I'll let you know in three years or so when it starts to fruit to see how long it took for that tree to recover. The plant that I put in its place, the tree I put in its place, much bigger, much healthier, doing great. No doubt I'll have fruit on that new tree a year or two before the experimental tree in another location. So there is patience involved. And if you have the patience and want to deal with a struggling tree, go for it. But if you're trying to develop a food forest or an, a mini orchard that you're going to have a harvest from in a relatively short period of time, then it might make sense to remove some of those plants that it's it, it's just prolonging their suffering by keeping them where they're at. Heather Lawless says, can you give the recipe for green stock soil mix? I'm confused on what to use. So uh, check out some of the videos. Uh, no doubt Jay will find it, but I've, I've got uh, a couple videos. One I did, uh, I think last year was the most recent one that I show my mix. I talk about the different types of mixes I use in my green stock. And I, and I have a video where I, I showed putting the soil in the green stock and I talk about the, the ratios that I use. Uh, it's primarily a peat based mix. And depending on, on what ingredients I have, they, it all generally follows two parts peat with one part of perlite and or vermiculite and so in the green stock i tend to use more vermiculite because vermiculite does hold some moisture whereas the perlite doesn't hold any moisture and the green stock like most containers tends to dry out faster than you would have in in a raised bed or any garden bed so generally it's two parts peat to one part vermiculite and then i add one part of compost to that and then I usually add half a part of worm castings and then to that I, I use the IV organic fertilizer 
it's a organic slow release fertilizer i'll add that to the mix and that's basically it now the exact ratio doesn't have to be perfect and so i have some blends instead of two parts peat and one part of perlite i'll use one part peat one part compost one part vermiculite and then i add the worm castings and then i add the fertilizer so there's a couple approaches to take the the three equal portions is easy to make it's kind of like mel's mix mel's mix um, mel bartholomew bartholomew's the one that wrote the book on square foot gardening and he does the the one part peat the one part compost and one part perlite and and so that basic ratio usually tends to work pretty well but i i like peat I have a lot of peat and it's relatively inexpensive so most of my mixes tend to be a little heavier on the peat because it does a great job of retaining that moisture in a, something like a container garden with the, the green stock tower system so hope that helps if it's more confusing check out that video on on making the soil mixes and, and you can see exactly how i mix it and it, it will definitely make a, a, a difference with it. And so Jay has posted the Facebook.com Gardener Scott. Now there's there are two different groups on Facebook. So there's the Facebook page Gardener Scott, and that's open to everybody. And I'll I'll put announcements on there and occasionally people will ask questions and I'll answer on there. But that is different than the Facebook Gardner Scott community page. The Gardner Scott community is a, a, a private group and you have to have the, the, uh, the membership to be able to, to get into that group. So I do have two different Facebook groups and they are slightly different. Jeremy says, we have two dogs, but the main garden is in the side yard, which is not fenced in yet. I know that feeling and fencing in the, the, the garden. So. I hope the, the rabbits subside, subside until you can get the fencing and everything in place. Heidi saying, can you help Brian Siebert with a link to the Facebook group? And so again, the that link I just showed from Jay is the open Facebook group. But to get to the other Facebook group, you have to become a member and in the membership information. It gives you the link to that that group and that will take you to the page that you then get the approval to enter so uh, now if you are a member and can't figure out how to get into it send me a message on the the page the Gardner Scott YouTube page on that community page you can actually post some some questions and uh, I can help you out with that uh, okay, let's see. Tennessee Nana. I'm seeing a lot of videos about electroculture lately. What do you think about it? So we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and I haven't experimented with the electroculture, so I can't give any specifics as to what I think about it. I, I've read some of it, and depending on how the electroculture, electricity, roots seeds there, there are different aspects to it i have read some research that talks about how electrical stimulation affects plants and it looks like it it could be an interesting approach for some things i i don't necessarily think it's something that most gardeners would be doing but uh i'll, I'll get back to you on that i've got it on my list of videos to talk about and to to do some experimenting and see what I think about electroculture, but uh, I I really can't can't say much about it right now because I haven't finished doing the research and there's conflicting information, and so I don't like to to speak on things unless I can definitely figure out what the what the core results should be and whether it's even easy enough for most gardeners to consider. Dennis Blevins, welcome, a new member of the Gardner Scott community. That's fantastic. And so it's always nice to, to see you 
or it will be nice to see you and we'll move forward with that fantastic okay brandy jacks is saying can anyone tell me if i can put garlic in an in-ground bed that i've had slug problems in if and what else can be planted in that same in-ground bed with or without garlic oh sure yeah put garlic in an in-ground bed and the the slugs aren't as big a problem with the garlic as they are with other plants one of the nice things about garlic is that you plant it in the fall and then it stays in the ground over winter and then it pops up in the spring and it's usually growing when the temperatures are still pretty cool which is usually before the slugs arrive especially if you live in a cold region like mine so my garlic grows up through the snow in the spring once the soil warms up and thaws the garlic starts growing and then it can snow and it'll still grow up through the snow and so those garlic leaves are getting nice and thick and by the time the slugs and snails arrive when the temperatures are warmer the garlic is just too big and thick and hardy for the slugs to really mess with those slugs are going after the young tender growth and they're typically not matched up with with garlic as a primary food crop so yeah you could definitely grow garlic in a bed that had a slug problem and same basic idea you can you can grow lots of other things i, I typically don't grow plants in the same bed as a garlic bed i'll i'll have garlic fill a bed and i'll have the garlic growing five to six inches apart and so that's just not enough space to put other plants in with my garlic but if you're just growing garlic in a portion of your bed you can grow anything else beyond that point i would suggest doing transplants same basic idea the slugs are less likely to attack a a big plant than they are a young plant and so you might consider putting transplants into a bed rather than um, starting from seed and giving those young seedlings the the opportunity to be eaten by the slugs but i've i've grown uh, i've got a bed right now where i'm growing squash in the same bed as my garlic because the garlic hasn't been harvested yet i started the the squash seeds on the other end of the bed and when i harvest the garlic i'll put in more squash seeds so it i've got succession planting of the squash plants in that bed so uh yeah if it's open space grow whatever plant you want to grow in that open space as appropriate for it and so yeah carmen's asking you plant garlic at the end of summer start of fall I'm going to try it this year so i've got i've got a really good video that <coughs> shows the whole process of growing garlic and it tells you exactly the timeline that you should be looking for you basically want to do it generally four to six weeks before your first frost in fall and so it varies by region depending on when your frost hits in fall for me here in colorado it's generally the end of September, beginning of October that I'm putting the garlic in place. And that's generally a good time for most people to aim for that September, October time frame. But take a look at your own uh, frost dates and that'll be the kind of thing to determine what's the best date for you. And if you know or can find other gardeners in your area that are growing garlic, find out when they do it. And that's also a good way to start it for that first year. So let's see, David Blevins says, been watching Gardener's Got Vids for a bit, just retired, so I have more time to garden. Good for you, Dennis. Thanks for watching my videos. You know, I have so many videos. I was trying to do the math the other day. <clears throat> and so just my regular videos, if you spent eight hours a day watching my videos, it would take you almost three weeks to watch all of my videos and if you go back and watch all these live streams eight hours a day it'll take you over a month so I, I i think it's crazy that i've been doing this for so long that there's that much material out there but 
There's a lot of Gardener Scott videos that you have the opportunity to catch up on. And especially as you're learning gardening and doing more in gardening, chances are you'll find one of my videos that matches what you're trying to do. So I look forward to hearing from you in the comments as you discover some of those videos in the future. And, uh, and maybe someday when I'm really retired, I'll go back and watch my own videos over again and see what I can pick up. You know, it's funny that I, I'll do that occasionally, especially if I'm making a new video and I think it's similar to an older video, I'll go back and watch the older video so that I make sure I'm not just doing the same over again. And occasionally I'll come across something that's like, oh yeah, I forgot that that's the way I like to do things, or I forgot that that actually works. Uh, there, there are so many things I'm always moving forward and trying new things. And there are a lot of things that I've done in the past that I don't do, not because it's it doesn't work, it's because I just am trying something different. And so I, I actually benefit from some of my videos as well, which may seem a bit ironic, but it definitely is part of the way I garden. WTH, do you have or like the earth boxes? So I don't have any right now. When I was at the Galileo school and and growing in that garden and greenhouse, we had a lot of earth boxes. And <clears throat> I, I'm not a big fan of them. And part of that is because here in Colorado, it's so dry that with any container, that uses a reservoir to to water the the plants and the the soil. What I've found is that the top of the soil dries out regardless of how much water is in that reservoir. It's just too dry, and so the bottom ends up being too wet. The middle stays moist, and then the top is always dry, and so. Even with an earth box and all the other containers I've used that have a reservoir, I still have to water those containers. And it, it, my basic thinking is if I'm going to have to water a container, why water it twice from the bottom and from the top? It just saves me a step if I just garden in a container and just water from the top and then have the holes in the bottom for excess water to drain out. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of them because it just doesn't match the way I garden and my specific climate. And I'm seeing that now. Eli and Kate and I are, are growing in the Oasis boxes that, that they, they sent me as a gift. And we show that in a recent video. And in my greenhouse, I've seen that as a problem. It has a pretty deep reservoir. And that reservoir dries out in a matter of a couple days and the top of the soil dries out very quickly. And so I'm watering those containers actually more than I'm watering my five gallon buckets that I've got tomatoes growing in. So uh, the, the, the dry air for me just doesn't work. For an area where the humidity is a little bit higher, and you don't have that drying out of the soil, containers like earth boxes and even the oases boxes, I think, may actually work out pretty well. Ralph Preston says, I'm wrestling with the removal of a 20-year-old oak because of the shade provides. Yeah, the, the big trees are really hard. I was just pointing out to uh, some friends that I had over this weekend. I've got a big log next to my fire pit that I'm going to be turning into a bench and that big log came from a big tree that I cut down as one of the first things I did when I moved into to the house I'm in now. It had some upper level damage. And in that case, I was worried that maybe one of the big branches might fall on my house. But it also was shading a big part of the, of the area. And it was going to interfere with some of my long-term plans. So I cut it down. And I've used the, the wood in other areas as stools and a future bench. And I'm making use of that tree now that it's it's down. So um, look, to, look to those aspects, Ralph. What would you gain with the tree not being there? And in my case, 
my, my design and my plan and the other plants I wanted to put in the tree just was in the way. And it was a big, tall, beautiful tree. And mine was about 20 years old as well. <clears throat> but it needed to, to come down because of some of that damage and because it really didn't match the, the rest of the, the, the landscape. So good luck making that decision because that definitely is a, a tough one. Bud's wondering, how do you refresh your soil in the Greenstock Tower? I have a video on this that I did, I think, last year <clears throat> that, that shows exactly that how I revitalize the soil in my grain stock. And so I do it at the beginning of the season. I take off each of the sections. I, I add new potting soil with nutrients added into it and fill up that level and stack it back up again. So yeah, you can see that video that shows that full process of how I revitalize the, the soil. And in fact, there's Jay right on top of things responding to Heather the video link on how to revitalize the old potting soil for containers and the green stock. And so it's not difficult. And I do it each year to make sure that I uh, have as good a soil as I can. I've noticed particularly this year, uh, and so last year I did a video where I was comparing the different mixes that, that I bought and I used my own potting mix and then I bought a number of different potting mixes and put them in the green stock and grew plants and then compared to how those plants grew <coughs> and then analyzed the, the potting soil in particular. Some of those potting soil blends were very high in organic matter, like, like not much perlite or vermiculite, almost all organic matter. And so what I've seen this year, even after topping off the levels at the beginning of the season, a lot of lowering of the soil level. Basically, all that organic matter is being eaten by the microbes and it's being decomposed and the level is dropping. So you do need to add soil to the green stock every year because it's going to be decompose and that level is going to, to lower. So yeah, check out that, that, uh, that video to, to see exactly how I do it. North Chester County News, would you suggest adding clay if you screen it, clay soil? It depends. Uh, the, it depends on what soil you have. It depends on why you're adding clay. Clay can actually be beneficial for the soil. The only, the only difference between clay and sand is the particle size of the soil. Most people that have nothing but clay soil hate it because it just retains so much water it, with those small particles and there's there's very little air when the water comes in and the water just stays. But from a mineral perspective, I, I, I think it's a great idea to add your own native soil to your garden beds. If you're gardening in raised beds, or in containers, long-term containers, and not adding your native soil, I think you're missing out on the mineral benefits that that soil provides, the nutrients that that soil can provide, and it helps keep that, that bed from sinking as the, all the organics break down. So it depends how clay-y the soil is that you're beginning with and I wouldn't add clay to clay, but as long as you're having organic matter in your beds, adding your native clay to it can actually be uh, a, a, a good thing to, to consider at, as you're, you're moving forward and trying to get the, the best out of your soil. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the, the picture in the background today. And so th this is a beautiful garden. I don't think this picture does justice. I, he, he sent me a couple pictures and, and this shows most of the garden. This comes from Dan Gallimidi and just a, just a really beautiful space. And so I'll talk about some of the wonderful things. Notice that in the background, a number of different types of gardening. And this is one of those things that I encourage that you do. So there's raised beds and there's containers, big pots. 
and you can see the big plants looks like squashes growing in containers that then have a trellis on it so fantastic demonstration to show how you can grow big squash plants in a container it's absolutely fabulous but then most importantly and let me move out of the way for a second you can see the beautiful raised bed structure that Dan built uh, multiple levels and if you look close especially in the far side you can see some raised beds that are shallow you can see other raised beds that are kind of medium you can see other raised beds that are high and a full garden with big stakes for trellising lots of big beautiful plants you can also see the the wire trellis in the background that's holding everything up and so nice compact beautiful the amount of work that went into building those raised beds just staggers my mind as to how how much effort it takes to to do a, a bed sequence like that but it's beautiful and everything is is stained or painted to to match everything else just a fantastic job dan so uh i, I love this garden space the he sent me a picture of uh, with a close-up of the garden beds themselves those raised beds absolutely beautiful but i wanted you to see the full scale of the garden against the fence to really get an appreciation for the amount of work that went into this garden and that's one of those things that i just love about gardening is it can be as much work as you want it to be it can be no work at all no raised beds growing in the ground and just letting your own naturally good soil grow all the plants that you have that's wonderful it could be the other extreme building some some beds with a very specific design and intent in mind as you put it together like dan obviously did and so if you look just over my shoulder you can actually see a bench that's built into the garden as well so i'm all about sitting areas in the garden and actually literally sit in the middle of your garden is one of the best things that i enjoy that i encourage others to enjoy as well so thank you so much for for sharing this and as we continue the show take a closer look at some of what you can see in the background <clears throat> and maybe you'll get some ideas of things you can try in your garden <clears throat> and so Thank you, Ralph Preston. I know I'm behind in the comments, but uh, thank you for that contribution. And how does one become a member? And so if, if you missed it before, look below this live stream and, and all my videos. You'll see a, a join button, depending on which kind of device you're, you're watching on. Uh, click on that blue and white join button and then a window will pop up and it will tell you about the perks it'll tell you what you get for the benefits of becoming a member and then it'll give you the the different member levels and there's three different member levels if you are watching like on your phone you won't have that blue and white button but you can go into the description and in the description below the videos there will be a link you can touch and it'll take you to where you can see what the perks are and then you can push on the 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 link to actually become a member and so it, it depends on which level you want to to uh, join at and depends on your device but but look in the description pretty much for everybody and that should give you an idea for for how you can how you can join us in the community and I'll be doing a members only live stream next week and so that goes out on the community page uh, on the Gardner, Gardner Scott community page to the members and it'll tell you when those those members only live streams if you're at the training or collaboration level Lucad's wondering what is the closest gardening gets to large conventional like comic con or gin con have you been to one was it worth it and so I haven't been to uh, and I'm not aware of like a, a, a national 
gardening convention like you might have a, a comic con or a gen con some of those are at the national level but you also have comic cons that are at the state level or at the city level and so like here in colorado every year in denver there is a a week-long event that would be that kind of convention and and so i've been to a few of those in a couple different states where it's usually targeted at at the the commercial grower and so it's lots of booths set up from lots of different agricultural companies but it's also lots of booths from nurseries and lots of booths from seed companies and the particularly here in colorado when i was very active in the master gardener program there was a booth set up for the master gardener program here in colorado and so you can often find something like that in most states sometimes they are are sponsored by a particular uh, organization i know that in the uk for instance you get into the 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 gardening in in countries like like wales and scotland and england and it's such a big part of of their society that you have the the world famous greenhouses and the royal horticultural society they will have events like that that run for a week and they have all of the competitions and all the prizes and all the classes and all of the booths <clears throat> and so that that's probably the closest that we get in the gardening world and a lot of it depends on where you live and what kind of, of events you have here in colorado springs where i live there are a number of smaller events and they're usually associated with with nurseries uh, the horticultural art society is a group that i was a trustee on for a number of years and each year they have a plant sale that lasts for three days and often as part of that, that plant sale there will be some education so i used to go to the plant sale and i would be there to talk about tomatoes or whatever questions people would have so you can look at those kind of things a lot of the other nurseries in my area will have uh, events that might take place over a weekend uh, there's one spencer's nursery i believe it is here in colorado springs will have a weekend and it'll be like eight hours each day with seminars and classes and and experts being available to discuss gardening so there are those kind of things that 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 you might be able to find and a good way to find that out is to go to your local nursery a nursery that you like to use and ask them the question because local nurseries are usually participating in those kind of events and they can give you an idea of which events you uh, you, you might want to be interested in <clears throat> Janice Gildia when do I put my compost from my tumbler into my garden good question <clears throat> so it depends on how you're going to be using that compost so if the compost is fully or mostly decomposed so that it looks like compost it's that nice deep rich compost i like to use that as a soil amendment i like to work it into my soil and i do that in the fall after i've put my my plants away after i've I've, I've either killed my plants on purpose or they've died from the, the cold coming in and I clean up my garden beds. Then I add compost and I work it into the soil so that it's in place through the rest of the fall and the winter and the spring. And then I plant in it in the spring and my plants do wonderfully. If it's more of a chunky compost, and especially in a tumbler, sometimes it's hard to get it to fully decompose and it comes out kind of chunky. I use that as a mulch often on top of the soil so after i amend my beds i'll use my chunky compost and just lay it on the surface and you can also do that alone without turning the decomposed material into the soil just add the chunkier compost on top 
as part of a no dig effort and it'll continue to decompose but it also protects the, the top of the soil from the sun and the weather and can be an effective mulch so I typically do that in fall as well but if you don't do it in the fall spring I think is the next best option in early spring as early as you can work the soil go ahead and amend your beds with your your finer compost or add it on top as a chunkier compost to help protect your soil going into your planting season so that's the approach that I usually take with with my compost <clears throat> and I've been doing that for a long time in fact I've got some chunky compost in one of my compost bins and I'm just waiting it's just sitting there it's breaking down a little bit more but it's it's no longer hot it's in a cool pile section and I'm just waiting till I amend my beds and I'm gonna throw that on top going into the winter and I may or may not mix it with straw and dried grass and leaves like I often do I'll probably just let it be that thicker compost layer going into the winter and it's easy it's not as much work when I do it that way and so Heather is saying what if anything should be done for soil with the cat mess the neighbors cats have started to use my containers as their litter box and it's killed several plants this is one of those things that you do need to be careful about <clears throat> there can be parasites in the cat droppings and some people particularly pregnant women really shouldn't be messing with soil that has those droppings in it so anytime you know that the cats have been using your containers strongly advise you wear gloves when working with that soil and you can you can do a couple different things you can try to take out those droppings i don't recommend growing the edible food crops in that soil until you've done something with it like like don't grow lettuce in that that soil again those pathogens that could be in the cat droppings can be right there in what you're going to eat so i wouldn't recommend that i would say you can still use that soil but solarize it so there's or or compost it so take that container soil take out the cat droppings and then just lay it out on a tarp in the sun for weeks and that'll kill anything that is in that soil that the cats would have brought in or take out the cat droppings and throw that soil into your compost pile because there will still be enough organics in it and then the bacteria in your compost pile should deal with anything that that might have been into that soil so it, it's one of those things that often it's kind of like the idea of sometimes you just have to kill the plant sometimes you just have to take out the soil and not use that soil again and especially if the cats have, have made a mess of it, it it might be best to start over again with new fresh potting mixes in those containers and then put some kind of barrier around them if you can or put something like a wire mesh on the soil so the cats can't get in there and dig and hopefully that'll that'll help with your your cat problem <clears throat> hello gardening with caitlin thank you for that contribution just saying hi and thank you for being you well thank you caitlin hi to you and thank you for being you that's, that's so nice to say that i i really do appreciate that that's that's why i love mondays you all are just fantastic people thank you so much caitlin that's great and it's 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 this community that's that's all of you are great and that's why i try to keep this such a wonderful place that we can come to on mondays and and that separate membership that members only group we have is it's it's not other people it's basically you know the same group of people it's a smaller group you know we don't, we don't have tons of people it, it's just a a really focused group but it, it's all just wonderful people like you and this group on Mondays is wonderful people like you so it's it's so fantastic you definitely warm my heart every week Thukad says you have a lot of older followers they have time and land to do this but what have you seen of younger gardeners I know the cottage core aesthetic is popular online so yes I do have <clears throat> 
mostly older gardeners, but lots of newer gardeners are are coming into the Gardner Scott community. And I I love that. And it's it's nice to see the demographics are are moving more in that direction. I still have uh, people that look like me as gardeners are are following me as gardeners. And so there's nothing wrong with that. We still have a lot of good time and good energy left in us to to be able to do that. But the 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 point, and I think you you may be asking this. <coughs> yes, those of us that are older, you know, we have the bigger houses and more property and more time on our hands, so we can have the bigger garden. And younger people, just starting out, might only have a a small house with a small property, and they're starting off gardening much smaller. And so I do get a lot of questions and am helping out a lot of younger people that fall into that category. And not everybody is necessarily young that falls into that category. But the, the, the smaller garden, the smaller gardening uh, approach with time and effort and money, uh, it, it's definitely out there. And, and I will be doing more videos along those lines. <clears throat> so... Right now, most of my focus is on building my garden to the point that I can then start focusing on some of the smaller things. My garden is made up of multiple gardens. I have a, a vegetable garden with my, my raised beds. I've got another vegetable garden with an enclosed area. I've got a pollinator garden. I've got my fruit trees. I'm going to be building a Moncala garden that you'll see in future videos. And so I, I have all these different types of gardens in different areas. And you'll, you'll be seeing more of that small cottage approach. I actually have an area that I haven't even begun working in. And if you go back to my videos where I drew out my plan, you can actually see off to one side. I call it the herb garden, but it's actually going to be a cottage garden. So I have a whole other area of my yard that isn't in my five-year plan that I'll be developing in the years ahead with that thought in mind of the, the small gardening perspective and how you can garden in a small space. So I'm not sure if that is exactly what you were asking, but, um, but that's, that's what I've seen. And I'm going to try to do more for the, the younger gardeners and those that are just starting out in the future. And actually, you know, I say younger, but... But there's a lot of people, a lot of you, who didn't begin gardening until you were older. You had that job and that career, and it wasn't until you had some time on your hands that you got into gardening. So the the new gardener mentality and how to approach it, I don't think is necessarily age-related. We tend to think of it as new young gardeners, but there's a lot of new old gardeners out there as well. So. I definitely want to try to, to do as much as I can to to do it. And so DLR978 says my body's blocking the background. So let me move out of the way one more time. And what you may not have seen, hopefully you did in that, that spot, you can always rewind and see it again, is, is the, the pavers, the base around those raised beds that Dan did is just beautiful. And so... Uh, yes, I did block out some of the best things, and I think that is one of the best things that that I blocked out. So um, <clears throat> Brian is talking to Bud Jenkins, the joys of being retired. Did you have an afternoon nap as well? That's funny. I'm not a napper, and so it's not something I typically do. Maybe at some point I'll be a napper. But uh, I, I typically spend my afternoon finding other things to do. That's funny. And there's Pepper Chris that signed on as a new member. I thought you were a previous member, but maybe you're just re-signing on. So thank you for that, Chris. Uh, it's nice to have you. I hope you have more vacations. I saw that you changed your day off. So I hope you'll be able to, to join us. Uh, and so Thukat's wondering about experience I have with a potager garden ornamental planting of harvest crops that still get used. That's, that is all part of my plan. So when I was talking about the cottage garden, it's going to be a potager garden. 
um, design. And so I, I, I've done that in smaller scale at a previous house I did before I was making videos. I did a little bit of that. And I love ornamental planting of harvest crops. So you'll be seeing that in future videos as well. I've got currants that are fruiting right now in my front yard landscape. And, and it's an ornamental part of my landscape, but it is uh, a harvestable crop. So yes, I, I am doing more and more with that. And you can expect to see videos on that. I, I, I like mixing it up. I like having plants. I think uh, <coughs> there are, are some plants in particular that like rhubarb and even carrots, I think can be beautiful landscape plants that we think of as, as vegetable garden plants. But I like to grow them in other areas as well. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And so um, I, I use herbs that way too. I'll grow herbs in, uh, in other areas around the garden um, as an ornamental plant. So absolutely fantastic opportunity. Willie Zolikoffer, how would you set up a wicking tub for a northern winter? Leave it bare, plant garlic, or completely empty it. And so <clears throat> the thing about wicking tubs in winter, especially in Indiana where you're getting freezing temperatures, <coughs> is that they're not going to wick anymore. They're going to freeze. And so, <coughs> excuse me, I would, I would drain the water reservoir and you could continue to grow something in it like garlic. It, it can be challenging to grow garlic in containers, especially in a wicking container where the soil may not be as deep as the container actually is because you have the, the water reservoir at the bottom. And so generally, I would say uh, just go ahead and clean up your, your wicking tub and and let it go for the winter uh it, it there are few plants that will do well in it and i'd say try garlic if you've got garlic cloves to plant give it a try <coughs> i tried growing garlic in uh, a five gallon container this last winter and i've had success with that in the past but for whatever reason, most of my garlic didn't do well over the course of the winter. And my my uh, container of garlic uh, didn't sprout like I have had it happen in the past. So experiment with it. And if the weather cooperates, then you'll have garlic. And then you can grow things in it again next year. That's the one thing about growing garlic in a container is you're locking up that container for an basically an entire season. And so if you don't have plans for that wicking tub next year, experiment with garlic. But containers typically will thaw out and be available for planting sooner than our garden beds. And so those are the kind of things, that's one reason why most of my containers I, I, I clean up and I leave open because those are the first places that I'm planting in in the spring. My green stock is typically growing seedlings before my raised beds or any of my in-ground beds because my green stock thawed out first. It's right outside my back door and I'm growing seeds in it right away. And so that's that's how I approach most container gardening is is growing in those containers during the active growing season and then just letting them sit over the course of the winter so completely up to you how you want to experiment with it or not moving into the the future but that might give you a couple ideas and some things to try <clears throat> so uh as as we start moving forward to the end of our season or for those of you that are in the southern hemisphere and you're in winter and beginning to move forward to the beginning of your season do give that thought to what parameters you are going to bring into your decision matrix about killing your plants 
the thinning, the pricking out, that's easy because we know we need to take care of some of those seedlings so that the others will survive. But what point are you going to use to determine that mature tree or that squash plant or the biggest tomato plant or whatever it is that you're growing in your garden? Start thinking about it now before you have to take it out. And I hope it'll make that decision easier because I've killed so many plants in my gardening journey. I have a pretty good feel for when I've had enough that I can kill those plants. But think of it from a, a time and energy perspective, and that might be helpful. All of us have limited time to do the things we want to do. We have maybe even less time to do the things we need to do. And so as you look at your garden, as you look at the amount of time you're spending in your garden, if you realize that you're spending more of your time on a particular plant or more of your time on a particular bed, and the reason you're spending that time on that plant or bed is because they're struggling, that could be an indicator that you're just taking too much effort to try to keep those plants growing. If if the payback is not worth what you're putting into it, maybe those plants need to go. And so that's that's a big factor I look into. If all of my beds are taking the same amount of my time, I'm not even thinking about removing any of those plants. But if I am going into my garden, and that's a, a reason why I like to hand water, because I can do an analysis and a decision of every single plant in my garden every single day. And if I'm going into my garden and every day I'm looking at a plant and I'm thinking, I wonder if I should pull that plant. It's probably time to pull the plant because you're, you're over, <laughs> overcoming your brain that's saying you should pull the plant and thinking with your heart that's saying, oh, I think I can make it survive. Go with the brain. Go with that gut reaction that I'm thinking this every day. I might as well act on it and then open up that space for something better and free up that time to the rest of the garden that could probably benefit from that extra time. Yankee Sista Homestead, thank you so much for that contribution and always being here. Always love your words of wisdom. Thanks and thank you so much. I do appreciate all that you do and all that everybody else does. It's just such a fantastic group. So I will be here because of your efforts next Monday. Same time, same channel. We'll talk gardening again and we'll see what that topic happens to be as we move forward in our gardening seasons. I'll see you then next Monday. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.